Welcome to the 25th annual Douglas West Memorial Lecture and the second Douglas West Memorial Virtual Lecture. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sean Morrison and I am the Ellen and Howard C. Katz Chair of the Brookdale Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine. And I have the honor and privilege of hosting tonight's event. A conversation with Ms. Kat Chow and her sister, Dr. Stephanie Chow. I want to begin by thanking Susie West for endowing this lecture in memory of her husband, Doug, and in honor of his physician, Dr. Diane Meyer. When Diane cared for Doug, palliative care was a new and emergent field in medicine. The Lillian and Benjamin Hertzberg Palliative Care Institute did not exist at Mount Sinai, and there are only three palliative care programs in academic medical centers in the United States. Um, a quarter of a century later now, every academic medical center has a palliative care program, departments and divisions of palliative care are common, and palliative care is present in over three quarters of the nation's hospital. Thanks to so many of you in attendance tonight, we have made remarkable progress to achieving our goal of ensuring that palliative care is integrated into the genome of American medicine. And I hope that we can continue to count on your support so that we can ensure that by our 2030 event, every, and I emphasize every, American has access to and receives high quality palliative care in the setting of a serious illness. Tonight's conversation tackles a topical, important, and controversial issue in palliative care, grief and bereavement. All of us at some point in our lives have experienced the loss of someone we love and the pain that accompanies that loss. Yet the path to recovery from that loss is uniquely different for all of us. When is grief normal? When is it not? When is it healing? When is it harmful? How does it shape who we are? How do the prejudices and norms of society influence the grieving process? I believe that our guests tonight are going to bring insight and answers to those questions. Like I suspect so many of you, um, particularly those in New York, I often turn to the editor's pick in the New York Times Sunday Book Review, both to get ideas of what to read next and also to get an idea of what I've missed in the past couple of weeks because I've been too busy to read it. Um, earlier this fall, I was struck by two books whose reviews I had missed. One was Cloud Cuckoo Land, which seemed like it would be a welcome diversion from COVID. And it wasn't quite as welcome as I thought it was going to be. Um, the other was a memoir. Um, it was called Seeing Ghosts, which appealed to me because it tackled the complexity of grief and how it can shape a, life, shape a life's course. And the editor's note read, nearly two decades after her mother's death, when Chow was just 13, her family is still in deep mourning an experience she documents with wit, poignancy, and fresh insight and imagery. The passage of so much time hasn't dulled the ache, the reviewer wrote. A certain kind of sorrow lingers because a part of us wants it and wills it to persist. And Chow artfully and intelligently maps which kind of grief this is. I made a note to buy the book. Um, so much of what has been written about grief and bereavement has been written from the perspective of a grieving spouse, um, a grieving adult child, and yet there's very little that's been written about what does it mean to be a teenager when you lose a parent. And it's not something that we think about in public very much, or as much as we should. And, you know, that week, um, I meet regularly with one of my faculty, Stephanie Chow, um, who runs a number of our programs. And Steph came in um, for our regular meeting, and before we jumped into our agenda, she said, I've got to show you this. I've got to show you this. And she says, you've got to see this picture of my sister. And she pulls up a picture of her sister standing in front of a huge promo poster for the book Seeing Ghosts in Times Square, which I had just said, oh, I've got to buy. And then 
everything clicked together. Chow, chow, Stephanie. <laughs> ah! Um, and I am thrilled um, to welcome Kat and Stephanie as our 25th West Lecture guests. And let me just briefly tell you about two of, both of them. Kat Chow is a reporter, uh, writer, and the author of Seeing Ghosts, a memoir, which was, among other things, named a New York Times Notable Book of 2021, a Barnes & Noble Best Book of 2021, and a Time Magazine Must Read of 2021. She most recently was a reporter at NPR, where she was a founding member of the Code Switch team and podcast covering race and culture. Her work has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, The Atlantic, New York Magazine's The Cut, and on Radio Lab, which, by the way, is a big hit with my stepson, among others. She's an occasional fourth chair of Pop Culture Happy Hour and is guest host of Slate's podcast, The Waves. She's received a residency fellowship from the Malay Colony, as well as an inaugural Yi Dai Up fellowship at the Jack Jones Literary Arts Retreat. She has led classes and spoken about her reporting in Amsterdam, Calgary, Minneapolis, Louisville, Boston, and Seattle, among other cities. Um, Stephanie Chow is one of our own. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Geriatrics and Palliative Medicine, Mount Sinai. She serves as the director of the Aging Life Innovations Goals and Needs, also known as a LINE program, which is our innovative high-risk ambulatory care model that delivers comprehensive team-based care to older persons living with serious illness and complex needs. Align specializes in co-managing vulnerable people, including those with debilitating surgery, requiring repeated emergency room evaluations, and transitioning between discharge settings. Dr. Chow also serves as one of our diversity, equity, and inclusion co-champions for the department. She is a passionate advocate for promoting equity and underserved patient and interprofessional health system communities. And it really is a pleasure um, to welcome both Stephanie and Kat. And I think I was going to introduce, Kat is going to start with a reading, but I, um, I'm going to let her introduce both the book and the reading, and then I'll pick it up from there. Thank you so much, Dr. Morrison. I really appreciate that introduction. And I'm not sure I knew the story of um, how you came to seeing ghosts. So I really appreciate that. Um, I also wanted to say thank you to Susie West and the rest of the West family for inviting me to participate in this evening in honor of Douglas West. I've been particularly excited about tonight um, and wish we were all in person because, as you know, my sister Stephanie um, is the person who I'll get to be in conversation with. So Seeing Ghosts is my first book, and it just came out at the end of August. And I feel very fortunate that it's received such lovely reception. And Seeing Ghosts begins with a bold joke that our mother made to me when I was a child before she knew she was dying. And she said that when she passed, she wanted to be stuffed and kept in my future eventual apartment to watch over me. So this was a very morbid thing to say, um, but it becomes the groundwork for the book and helps turn it into a ghost story. And I'll let you decide if the ghosts are real or imagined. And although this book is grounded in the fallout of my mother's passing, I like to talk about seeing ghosts as a story about loss rather than simply just one about grief. Loss of not just a person, but a place, a country, a sense of self and body. It's so much about my father too, and it traces the way that loss haunted my family over three generations, following my grandparents and parents and their emigration from China to Hong Kong, Cuba, and America. And I used my background as a reporter to shape this narrative into one about, among many other things, taxidermy, hence the cover, um, as a metaphor for memories and grief the ways the legacies of white supremacy and capitalism work across race and class, affecting one's access to health care and sense of belonging. And by asking questions like, what is it exactly that my family owes to ourselves, one another, institutions, the countries we call home, the people who are no longer around, I explore with seeing ghosts the ripples of longing. And today I'm going to read a brief passage that um, I think sort of examines 
the prolonged grief that I really wanted to get across. My father held the square tin as though it were a gift he'd just received, his elbows bent, box in both hands just below his chest. As he approached the van where Steph and I waited, it looked for a moment like he wanted to shake the container to determine if it held a candle, a watch, a glass figurine. In reality, it was a canister of ash and bone fragments. The ashes of my brother Jonathan, a debt he owed to his dead wife. A month after her funeral, the three of us were at Cedar Hill so that my father could pay for Jonathan's remains to be disinterred then cremated. It struck me then how many transactions were necessary in mourning. So many invoices to be paid over the past few weeks, the obituary notice, the funeral services, the casket, the flowers, the burial, the death certificate, Jonathan's disinterment and cremation, and eventually my mother's monument. Steph and I waited for our father in the car, not speaking as we watched the smoke drift from the building's chimney and fade into the trees. I wondered who we were witnessing take on another form. As we left, bursts of gold and crimson scattered throughout the cemetery. The monuments obscured the groundskeepers and their leaf blowers, which made it appear as though ghosts had kicked that foliage. At home, Steph and I took turns standing at the microwave to reheat bowls of a thin broth with pork bones, boiled mustard greens, and winter melon. I warmed crispy noodles in a pan and we slathered them with a gravy of fish cakes and bok choy we'd made the previous weekend. We ate these without speaking, spooning rice into our soup and slurping loudly, chomping on the noodles with visible, audible relief. Afterward, the TV still blasting the nightly business report with Paul Kingus, our father carried the tin with Jonathan's ashes to the family room. For the next decade, my parents' only son would sit at the base of the fireplace behind a jungle of wilted and rotted plants. Watching my father clutch his son's ashes, I understood the weight of what he held. One can grieve a person, place, or ideal. All of those things have heft. The word itself, grieve, comes partially from the Latin graver, to make heavy, cause grief. Heavy, like the realization that his wife and son were not ready to leave their lives behind that each of us was scared of death and all that it would bring, that with it, our sense of home, the people who made it, and the paperwork that codified it, could easily be upended. Freud wrote famously about mourning and melancholia. These two types of grief were distinct from one another, he posited in an essay from 1917. Mourning had an end in sight, A person mourning had a grief that adhered to a specific person or object, but melancholia was an ongoing state, pathological almost. The melancholic may know they have lost something, but not exactly what they have lost. The scholar Anne Anlin Cheng puts it this way in The Melancholy of Race. The melancholic eats the lost object, feeds on it as it were, eats, feeds, as though those who have internalized loss become ravenous in their hunger for sustaining that grief. It bloats them, but they continue to feast. Perhaps instead of asking if I'm exorcising or taxidermizing you, I should ask if really I am taxidermizing myself. What within my grief am I afraid to lose? It is the idea of her, of course. Here, so many years later, it can't shake her death and don't want to seem don't seem to want to in the first place eats feeds eats feeds insatiable but chang's broader argument is that identity formation and racial identity formation in particular is melancholic itself and is shaped by the push pulls of loss and recovery i get this the immigrant family tries to preserve a history and a life that the surroundings resist they try to invent a new way of being while always seeking a home within the negative space. Thank you. Wow, thanks Kat. And just for that brief excerpt, I um, hope for those of you who have not read Kat's book that that is a reason to go out and buy it from your local independent bookseller. Um, Kat, I wanna follow up 
Let me just start by just following up on the passage that you just read. And you write of the term racial melancholia, um, which was coined by three Asian American scholars. And having looked back, and this was in the New York Times recently this week, when we start thinking about prolonged grief, that it seems to me that this may be another way of talking about prolonged grief, um, which is now being considered a, um, a diagnosis, an abnormal diagnosis. And so I wondered if you could elaborate a little bit on the similarities, differences, and what you were thinking of. Yeah, so I think as a child, when my mother died, she died when I was 13, and it was quite sudden. Um, and I think that was such a shock. And as a teenager, I didn't have the words for what I was experiencing or how it seemed that her death was, I mean, of course, one of the most impactful things to have ever happened to me or my sister, Steph, or our other sister, Caroline, or our father. Um, and I felt for very, for a very long time that her death felt almost like an identity to me. Um, but it wasn't even just about her and the loss of her, but it felt like something larger. It felt so tied to our family being um, immigrants from Hong Kong by way of China. And I lacked the vocabulary for many years um, to be able to articulate exactly what this meant and how she had become this identity or this way of seeing life, this lens, so to speak. And so I think that's why when I finally read um, Racial Melancholia, Racial Disassociation, which is by David Eng and, and Shin Hee Han, um, a professor of English and also a social worker, social clinical therapist. Um, I was really drawn to that term because I felt that um, it, it really spoke to what I see as an Asian American experience, so to speak. Um, and also just the way in which someone is, who is experiencing a prolonged loss, um, it, it just becomes so much of who they are and you don't quite know what it is you have lost but you know that you have lost something. When I, and I'm thinking as through that process, and I, I think one of the things that struck me in many respects about the book, and I learned so much about, was that it was framed around this, an immigrant perspective on grief. And I, I, I'm sure that was a deliberate framing. Um, yeah. But I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, A, why it was important to frame it that way, and B, how you thought about it, you know, as these years evolved and what changed. Yeah, I think that for so long, the way that I wanted to write about this book was structured through the idea of what we owe our family members. Um, and so what, you know, Steph, Caroline, and I owed our mother in particular, because the idea of filial duty is so big in a lot of East Asian families. And filial duty is just this concept of um, wanting to respect your elders and, and pay respect and homage to them. And I, I felt that so much in our, our grief. Um, and I think I feel that still, um, especially toward my father, who is very much still alive. Um, and I think he's tuning in now. Hi, Daddy. Um, and I, I think that I, I wasn't sure how to, you know, tell that story without also including the ways in which our parents also experienced loss, not just loss of their own family, but loss of home, loss of um, a sense of stability, um, a loss of a sense of self too, coming to a new country. Because I think that loss and grief can just be experienced in so many different ways. Um, so that was really crucial to me. And I wasn't, you know, as a 13 year old, I didn't know how to process that or explain that to people. But um, as a reporter who has, you know, my beat um, when I was at NPR was basically Asian Americans more broadly, but also immigrants and people of color. Um, and I could always sense these threads of grief in all of the stories that I was really attracted to. And so I knew that I needed to ground it in my families. And Steph, let me actually bring you in because you experienced 
the same loss, but as a young adult, not as a teenager. Um, can you, I guess, reflect a little bit about what might have been different? And I think a little bit about your experiences versus cats. I was 21 years old and I know that it was, I mean, it, it was so hard for all of us. And in the way that I was the oldest and had some time to live apart from my family, I think each step of my life into a different level of training allowed me to put up in some ways barriers and distance myself this was a protective way for me to kind of experience that loss. And so I think in some ways I appreciated having gone to college um, and in the later years going to medical school and residency, each step kind of put me in a new setting where I could try to rebuild and figure myself out. I recognize that Kat didn't have those same kind of markers um, and experiences of the years. And I, I've felt that in some ways, each time moving into a new stage of my life, I was allowed to, in some ways, start a little bit over. Um, Kat had mentioned, you know, that kind of silence of not really referring or talking about things, um, avoiding topics. And that was something that with each new group, it was something that I could either decide to engage in or not. Um, and so as I became more comfortable with sharing my grief, and it took a long time, I was able to speak a lot more openly about it. But I do recognize that as events evolved in my life and new things, new relationships, getting married, um, having a family, going through different parts of my training, I was able to grasp onto different parts of my life that I was rebuilding. Um, but I would say that my experience as being the daughter of immigrants and the idea of belonging in a space, it took me some time to, to think about that. Even in medicine, as a student navigating the halls of University of Buffalo um, and then at Brown, places where I was not like everybody else, I did recognize that difference. And so the idea of speaking out and kind of looking at our experiences through healthcare, it was striking. When I take care of patients now with Align and our patients are majority communities of color, I do feel this difference uh, in how they approach the healthcare provider, how they express their grief, their loss, not just of people, but of themselves as they manage their, their severe illnesses. And so I think that this perspective um, has helped and protected me, allowed me to kind of release my grief in incremental ways. Mm. And I guess to follow up on that, Kat, one of the things that was, I think so disturbing to me reading this book was the sense of loneliness and isolation that you portray as a teenager. And as Stephanie said, the silence in the family, which is not unusual, about talking about her. And, you know, what I'm hearing from Stephanie is she had this opportunity to, with each new step in her life, decide whether she was going to engage or not engage, but you don't have that as a teenager. And I'm wondering both how that shaped you into an adult um, what it meant for your family in some respects um, because of this sort of hidden thing which was so powerful and also, um, you know, the death of, what, of your brother. Um, again, something that was, as you said, put away and, and not talked about and just sort of there but present. Um, and if you could spend a little bit about that and then come back to what if you could take a sort of magic wand and you know, back when you were a 13 year old, what would have helped? And what, as a healthcare system, what could have we have done better? Yeah. I mean, I think one of the things that I keep thinking about, um, you know, and that I really wanted to get across when I was writing Seeing Ghosts was this idea of agency 
because when you are 13, that's about the age when you think you are an adult, but you are really not. Um, I'm sure Stephanie can tell so many stories tonight, but she won't um, about those teenage years um, when she was uh, in medical school and I was um, starting high school right after my mom, our mom passed. But as a writer, I think I was really wanting the story to focus on this idea of um, what it means when a teenager loses somebody who is grounding and a very, you know, present adult figure in their life. Um, because after that, it's all about reinvention. Um, and I think that, of course, as a 13 year old, that's not something I could articulate or knew to do. But I, I realized that I was so drawn to adults. And I think that was a very fortunate thing because um, I would always go to my guidance counselor following my mother's death. And I would, you know, hang out in the school psychologist's office a lot, probably every few days or so. Um, and it was at the suggestion of one of my guidance counselors who, um, you know, invited me to participate in a thing called Good Grief Group, which was a grief group for high schoolers at our high school. We got to meet, you know, every other week and it, uh, the schedule basically cycled through different periods of the day. So that meant you could miss different um, classes and they always provided really good snacks. Um, so I don't know if Steph, Steph actually knows that story. I didn't know that. Yeah, I, I basically would go for the snacks because I, you know, as a teenager, I would always think like, I'm okay, I'm fine. All these other kids are just like, wow, that's just a lot. But um, after a while, I really started to open up in it. And that same guidance counselor and school therapist, I think realized I could benefit from seeing a therapist on my own. And so, um, you know, and Steph, we can talk about this if you want, but um I, I remember approaching my family and saying, I, I really think I need to go to therapy. And um, at first, my our father was pretty hesitant, which I think is not um, unusual in a lot of East Asian families or Chinese American families, or at least specifically ours, because this idea of um, talking about something, you know, death is all in your head is something that I would always, that I quoted in the book a bunch of my father saying, um, or at least this grief is all in your head. And that would, I remember that would be such a frustrating thing to hear because I would have to say like, yes, that is incredibly true, but is also something I'm experiencing. Um, and so as a teenager, just having the guidance of adults, um, who are also not actively grappling with the same death was really what helped me. And I think, you know, thinking about this in a medical context, Steph, maybe you could translate how this would apply. I mean, with like therapists, social work. Yeah. Um, oh. Yeah, in, in I mean, so, how? yeah, I mean, I think just having um, the guidance of, of um, adults, you know, come in who can really, uh, provide provide um, a way to nurture, I think is what I'm trying to say. A framework for, for bereaving and, and grieving and how to find ways to cope and explore your reflections. Yeah. And I'm glad that that was available for you because I know that for at that time I was coming back from medical school, I'd taken a year off and I didn't know how to support you. Um, I was still learning myself and struggling with with grief. Yeah. And I think um, there is just a lot of taboo in family, um, Dr. Morrison, to kind of go back to that question. Um, and I think there's probably also stuff I imagine that you see a lot of that in your medical practice too, right? Just this concept of death as taboo and speaking about it. We have a lot of conversations about patients when they reach a certain part of their of their health trajectory. And we would like to talk a little bit about, you know, what they're hoping for. Um, and there's a lot of conversation that goes about. There's a lot of also difficult, um, challenging, uh, some pushback and some, a lot of hesitancy. Steph, um, I don't know how much Kat shared with you um, 
the book as it was being written. Um, I know if it was my younger brother, I wouldn't get to look at it at all. Um, and I wonder though, when you read it at, at various stages or when you read the final copy, I wonder if you could reflect a little bit about what you were thinking, looking at your family, I guess from the outside in, in some respects, or the inside out. When Kat told me she was writing a memoir, I was really nervous and afraid. Um, she wanted us to read it ahead of time. She's very, I mean, she interviewed, being a reporter, she interviewed us all several times, many times, had the recorder and everything. And I was trying to wrap my head around what she could put, um, how she would portray it. I think uh, I read it in probably maybe, I don't know how, it was in two days. I just couldn't put it down. And I remember I woke up early in the morning just to finish it and I was sitting outside and I just closed it. Actually it was a Kindle, so I couldn't close. I held it against my chest and I just kind of sobbed a little bit at the end. It was incredibly powerful. It was amazing to see her insightful reflections and how she ask the questions and then put it down on paper. Um, I think uh, many of my friends and, and close colleagues approached me and asked, you know, would it be okay for me to read your sister's book? Is that okay? Um, actually, you asked me to. <laughs> and I remember at first I wasn't sure. It's a very vulnerable, it makes me feel a little bit exposed and, and everything. But, you know, the more I thought about it, I realized this story has to be told. Um, it is, you know, my family's story, our family's story, but it is an important part of being an American, growing up um, with family with who came from another country, different cultures, but still experiencing this very American way of living and grief. And people need to hear more stories like this. And so this was, as part of you know DEI, this is probably one of the most important things that I might do to kind of spread that information and let, allow people to see, have a window into a family that could feel real. Um, and that they might know at least a person in that book. So my hope is that this will leave an impression for those who are here who have read the book um, and that it's okay for them to know this about me. I'm very proud of, of this and what Kat has written. Oh, thank you, Steph. <laughs> I was, yeah, I, I know I did ask that permission. Um, and as I read it, I was struck um, both as you said, by the similarities that existed between um, my family and my background, and also the differences. And it gave me an insight into um, Chinese American culture that I really appreciated and didn't have before. Um, and just DEI is diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, just wanted for those. Now, I, so what I was hearing, Steph, is that Kat interviewed you and your family all the way through this and recorded that. Is that is that what I'm hearing? Yes. Yeah, so I'm gonna, I since I am also an older brother, um, I am going to give you the opportunity to, um, um, you know, payback is fair play. Are there questions you wanna ask your sister um, or are things that you wanna know from Kat that you didn't get an opportunity to do because now is the time to do that? <laughs> I wish I could um, phrase it as well as Kat might do it. Um, but I guess my, my first question would be about the title, Seeing Ghosts, um, specifically seeing um, Mommy or Moogie, as we call her, and, and how this kind of seeing ghosts helped you, um, if it helped you or not, with, with, your, with grieving. What did mm -hmm. it do? I think it was really important for me to frame um, this as a ghost story because in a lot of ghost stories, there, you know, there's something that the, the person who has passed and is a ghost um, usually has something that is like unfinished business. And I really wanted that to be the driving force throughout the book. This idea that um the dead are also, you know, something perhaps to be a little bit afraid of, or maybe something to be, um, you're uncertain about. I really wanted that emotion to be conveyed um, 
And this is, this is sort of where I put my writer hat on and I wanted to have fun with it. I wanted our mother's presence to be both scary, but also funny, a little bit irreverent. Um, and I think that a lot of the humor in the book actually comes through. I hope I don't, I, I think you agree. I think we've talked about that. I left at all your jokes. Oh, good. The chow humor. Um, and so I think that, so seeing ghosts, you know, it's there, it, this book is so much about, um, the idea of what is left behind and how we memorialize someone. And I think that I wanted ghosts to be a metaphor for grief because it like, that just seemed so important where, um, you know, grief is so haunting the image of somebody um, and whether or not, you know, as I said earlier, this ghost like figure of our mother is imagined or real. I wanted the reader to have something that was so evocative and almost disruptive um, while reading the text um, to kind of give a ghost-like feel. Um, because I think when so we lose somebody, it's it's quite natural to have these thoughts that may seem intrusive about them. Um, and I think that being able to create sort of this ghost-like figure also helped convey that longing. And I think that longing is um, a, an emotion that I really wanted to embody. I, um, in thinking about the seeing ghosts, I always remember um, when she played hide and seek with us and she would jump out. And so sometimes when I'm rounding a corner and it's dark at night, I kind of think, oh, maybe. <laughs> and it wasn't until I read your book where I would start thinking about that because I never I never uh, memorialized her as the idea of seeing a ghost of her coming around or taxidermied her. Um, but it actually made me think about that. So <laughs> I guess I have you to think <laughs> when I'm nervous. <laughs> And I think um, the yeah. And to expand on that, I mean, one fun anecdote that is in the book, but maybe people here would like to know is um, during thunderstorms, when power would cut out our mother, you know, we would rush to her and we would cling to her side because we would be afraid. And um, she would rush away while saying, no, we have to play hide and seek now. And so we would just be scrambling after her in the dark, looking, looking for her. Um, yeah. Um, I will ask a more uh, serious question, actually specifically about a part of the book, because I actually decided I was going to get some real questions in that specifically have passages from the book. There's a third section of the book you write about a tragic event that happened when you were a student at the University of Washington, in which a man named In Su Chun douses himself with gasoline and lights himself on fire. You write that a colleague at your student newspaper later reported a story on the details of Chun's death, that he had thought there were Korean operatives who had infiltrated the school custodial system where he worked and that he was being monitored. You make a comparison to our parents' lives and those of immigrants who suffer in silence. I write, you write how they can seem so alone in their interior lives where their needs in life had slipped beyond notice, how Chun returned to me in a defensive stance so bothered by how easy it was to look past stories like this. Um, and so in kind of, this is a segue, but something that really was left a big impression was this story and how looking past the life and our parents. And I wanted you to talk a little bit more about this, about this piece. Yeah, I think that um, whenever I thought about him, um, In Su Chun, who passed my freshman year, of college, um, right as the school year was starting, I really couldn't articulate the feeling that I had. Um, it felt so specific to again being the daughter of immigrants, and I couldn't, I couldn't really understand why I was so. I mean, you know, besides the horrific details of his death, why I just couldn't stop thinking about it, him. Um, it. it the fact that there was so little information about him, the fact that it almost seemed as though nobody cared, it really upset me, it angered me because I think that so much is lost when we can't memorialize or remember the people who um, have left us. And I kept imagining his family and wondering about the circumstances of his death. And so eventually, you know, three years later or so, when a friend at the school newspaper wound up writing about In Su Chun, um, those details painted a, you know, a, a um, complicated portrait of a man who 
um, had really struggled to make a life in America. And I think often, um, you know, our, our family has so much joy in it, um, but there is a, I think, a complicated trajectory that we had coming to the United States. And I saw so many of similarities and resonances. And I think about it often too today in the context of um, what's happening in this country with regards to um, xenophobia and racism, um, particularly against Asian Americans and how I think for so long and for so many people that type of violence, um, it's very easy to have a visceral reaction to, but sometimes it's very hard to talk about because I mean, we, of course, don't lack the facilities or language to talk about racism, but I think sometimes it can feel um, hard to hard to feel not alone when we discuss it. Yeah. And so I think with seeing ghosts, I felt myself wanting to channel that and to really tie this all together. I, I know I'm hogging the airtime. I wanted, so another question was about channeling yourself. Oh. Um, this is one of, you know, I still have, I'm doing, I'm much better about talking about mommy, but, you know, writing about something like this, this powerful, this um, life changing and, and traumatic, how did you write this um, and protect yourself, protect your heart? Um, how do you, how do you give, you know, what kind of advice would you give to those who might want to try yeah. to experiences. Yeah. I mean, I think taking care of mental health is really important. Um, and, um, I, you know, when I was writing this book, I knew that it was going to be very hard and I'd been writing it basically for almost a decade, um, trying to tell different versions of it to the point where I think when you tell a story so many different times or try to, it almost becomes as though it is not, it's still your story, but it almost feels different. And I think, you know, though I had experienced this grief and had, um, you know, I can still feel things so viscerally and I do often and writing specific scenes was very difficult. And also narrating the audiobook was so hard. Um, I, I think very much, um, I just was really gentle with myself. There's a writer, Min Jin Lee, the author of Pachinko, and free food for millionaires who, um, when I had sold the book, I was asking her for advice. And, um, she basically said, I speak to myself when I'm writing in the most gentle of voices. And, um, I'm the kindest to myself because it is hard. You're constructing this world that you might not have wanted to revisit. And I think that was really important to do. And, I don't think it was necessarily cathartic writing this book because I, I see it as work in a way. This is like my profession. Um, but in a way it helped me, it helped give me a framework. And I think you and I have talked about that framework a lot. Um, and the change that you saw in me in telling this story. Say more about that change, Kat. Well, maybe Steph can tell me more about that. Change. <laughs> okay. Oh, touche, touche. I think the question so what, was, what did you did you see a change in her as she was writing the book stuff yes it i think um the part about us not talking about it is certainly true we did not really talk about it i think we were just trying to grapple with our own silos of grief um and so it was a lot of mourning and silence a lot of grieving grieving crying thinking, um, a lot of journaling. And for Kat, we all withdrew and I think part of it I missed. So I was, <laughs> I will apologize. Um, but I think as she started, it, it was courage. She, she started building her courage. She started asking questions, exploring, talking, um, writing the story allowed her to actually seek out family and person she hadn't contacted or talked to in, you know, those years that we were really isolated as a, as a family with such tragedy. And she actually even 
we started relationships with those that she, um, you know, had had a little had uh, fights with before. And I saw her gain more confidence, gain more just this this energy. Um, she she really had this used it as work. Right. So that was one thing that motivated her, got her going and kind of pulled her out of this this dark place. And she put it on paper and she rewrote it and revised it. And I could see that change. I saw that energy and that, that life coming back, um, that inspiration. Would you say the same, Kat? Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, think, I think so. I mean, I think that um, when you, I, don't, I think there's something to be said about trying to tell the same story in so many different ways where you can tell so many versions of it and finally figuring out a way to tell it the way that I've always wanted has been so satisfying. And I think, I mean, you know, I know that with your department, you're working on a lot of narrative medical writing, for example. And I think it's, it's really hard sometimes to figure out the story, but sometimes when you do, it's so clarifying and it helps you understand so much of yourself also. Like I see this book as a lens of everything that I'm fascinated by as it relates to grief, as it relates to loss. Um, and it's almost like I completed a thesis project, um, where, but that is still hopefully artful, um, that, that, um, you know, the things that I've been trying to say and, and get across and speak out to the world. And hopefully I was able to do that successfully. I'm going to, um, open it up for questions from, um, the audience in, um, in a, just a couple minutes, but I wondered before I did that, each of you, if you had any last reflections before I open it up to the broader world. And let me just stop there. Let me just ask if you any further reflections. Steph, why don't I start with you and I'll give your sister the last word then. Um, I have watched my sister write this and it created this, this inspiration for her and also for myself. And I'm so grateful to be a part of this and hear her story, how her story um, continues to inspire others. So thank you. And Kat? Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me be on. I mean, it's just stuff. It's amazing to really get to speak to you in this type of space. Um, I and I think, you know, over the past years that I've been writing this book, it's been amazing to have the family support, but also, um, you know, telling this story that is our family's story too. Um, so I've got a I've got a question already, um, and Steph, this is for you, I'm afraid. And it goes: How do you reflect on this memoir and conversations with Cat through the lens of a physician, specifically what you practice now, that would have wanted that you would have wanted for yourself and your siblings back then? I know that I was a medical student. I was going into medical school when this happened and I, I it's just we felt so alone and I don't know if it was the fault of the medical team because I remember every time my family would pull me into the conversation and say oh you're you're going to be a doctor you listen to what they're saying we don't understand anything and then me just trying to understand well I just studied this you know maybe anatomy physiology maybe um and just trying to put it together but the the team really felt, you know, they, they felt more comfortable trying to talk to me versus um, my family, uh, the, the, the husband, uh, the, the sister of, you know, the patient. And it, it, I was proud to be a part of it, but it was, you know, it is a lot to, to kind of think about it that way. Um, and I think the medical team did try. And I remember the resident really took more time I, I think it was just no matter what, there is this feeling of isolation and grief um, when you're left, because at the end of the day, the medical team will go home and you are left with all this, um, no matter how hard they try. And so it's kind of this 
I don't know if, if the team can really win at it. Um, but, you know, for example, the resident went out, you know, went a little bit more into the conversation, talked a little bit more to me, um, tried to, you know, include more of the family. I still remember this resident um, and her, her name. And I still remember, you know, the time that she took with us versus other doctors. Yeah. 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 And I think the nurse is also um, having that. I did stay overnight and I remember hearing my mom talk about, you know, her fears and her thoughts and they don't understand me. And so there are just some parts that even we absorb so much uh, and we don't may not consciously recognize it in the moment of our grief, but there is so much that, you know, goes in a fleeting kind of action or moment or, or kind of gesture that that really does make a difference. So that's something just to remember. Um, I have a question from our chair emeritus and my former boss, Dr. Albert Sue, who says, I love the book. Thank you. As Americans, we are a blending of many cultures, each with their own processes for processing death, burial and grief. I'm struck by the similarities and dissimilarities of our experiences, even though I also have roots in China and Cuba. Could you reflect on how we bring together these differences and agglomerate them while honoring the separate cultures? A very easy question to answer. I will turn it to whoever wants it. I think that's a really good question. And I think that was something that I thought a lot about. Um, it was really important for me to show how natural and how, you know, every day the way my family grieved did so um, through ritual, through burning of incense, through, um, you know, visiting the grave and um, cooking a, a big meal on Lunar New Year, for example. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm recovering from COVID. <coughs> but um, I think that one of the things that was really, really helpful um, for me to write about was just generationally also. Um, we experienced these grief rituals and how the distance of you know time from immigration um, really could affect how different people within the same family even, um, you know, see these rituals. But I think one of the important things for me to really get across was, you know, for me as a first generation, or I guess second gen, if you consider that second gen, as the daughter of immigrants, um, I found it, you know, really important to show how by the end of this narrative, at least that was contained in seeing ghosts, um, I felt more comfortable taking my family's practices as my own and I was able to find meaning from them. And so I guess that's a long way of saying, I think that um, a way to bring these differences together is to just let people um, take what take parts that are meaningful for themselves and to learn how to build a ritual. Cause I think that's, that's something that's not, that can't really be taught, um, but it's something that can be experienced. I, I think also, no, go ahead, Stephanie. sorry, um, I was just thinking it allows us to be seen. And I think that's what every, every cult, every person wants to, and no matter where their background is in America, any person, not even just Americans, everybody wants to be, feel seen, feel heard. Um, it doesn't really matter what their values or how they, you know, they want their themselves to, it, it's the idea of their identity and, and to be able to fulfill these wishes and, and these these dreams and to have that love and that care through, you know, for in this concept, like a health system is um, something. And yeah, I, I think this, the uh, stories like this, even if they are different, it is a story that shows a different perspective. And so all together, we put them together and realize those pieces, like Kat's saying, you pull those pieces that are similar. Um, and we just need so many more of them, a kaleidoscope to see it all together as one big picture. Um, I'm going to jump one because we would not be here without Diane Meyer, so I'm going to jump right to her question. Um, Steph, can you reflect on how this experience influenced your experiences as you became a doctor? When I was deciding my profession, <laughs> I actually thought that I thought I was going to be a surgeon, actually, because I really loved dissection and anatomy and physiology. That was our first class, and I loved it. Um, 
And then when my parents were getting older, I realized, oh, they're, they could be vulnerable. Um, I should learn, I should learn how to hear them. And I think, uh, that was actually before my got sick. And when, when she passed, actually, that's, that's all it took. But my first patient was, my first patient was 78. Um, the first patient I lost, that was my first, first patient in, of intern year of, of family medicine was also, she was 68. Um, every patient I've had, uh, I kind of imagine taking care of my mom. If she, you know, she was 48 when she passed and I'm just thinking, you know, I would be taking care of her and, uh, and my dad, you know, so it's uh, thinking about how to honor her and those like her is is really what my my role in, in taking care of you know difficult patients, seeking out you know those challenges. I don't want the trade forward. I want to really figure it out and and struggle with these patients who want to be seen, who want to be heard in this health system and really find those opportunities to break down what is not working um, and make it work for them and make them feel that they have us on their side, our team, and to carry them forward so that they can be memorialized in a way that they are proud to be and that their family recognizes that, that this person's life is of value. I'm going to pose just one more question that appeared in the chat, and I'm not sure, Kat, if you can answer it, but I'm going to pose it anyways. Um, writing a memoir at this age, are there perspectives you have now that you wonder about reflecting on in years to come? In other words, are there things you think you're likely to feel differently down the road? Um, and what are they? Yeah, that's a great question. That is something that I thought constantly of, um, because I, you know, when you're writing a memoir, you're also writing creative nonfiction in a way, um, or at least you're taking your life and you're telling one version of it. And so even now, if I were to rewrite this book, I could rewrite it in four different ways. Um, and I think that's actually why the process was so hard and why by the end, my editor was just like, please, I'm going to have to wrestle this manuscript out of your hands, Kat. I need it. Um, but I, I do think a lot about how you know, I think about grief will shift and change. And I mean, I think that's so natural too, um, particularly um, in the context of motherhood, for example, where if and when I do become a mother, how will that change my orientation toward my own mother and the way I think about her? Um, and I think that's something that's quite natural. Um, and I'm sure that you know, when I read this book again in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years or 40, 50, hopefully, hopefully 60, um, 70, but we'll see. Um, I hope that, I hope that it can speak to, you know, what I understood as I was writing it in my twenties and thirties. So in the interest of ending on time, um, let me just close with a couple of um, thank yous and remarks. First, um, to Susie West and her family for endowing this lecture and allowing us to learn for now a quarter of a century. It's hard for me to think about the fact that I vividly remember the first West lecture um, 25 years ago. Um, to Diane Meyer for her care of Doug and also for the work she has done both locally, nationally, and internationally um, to build the field of palliative care. And my really deepest and heartfelt thanks um, to Kat and Stephanie Chow. It is difficult to talk about your family. Um, it's difficult um, to put that down on paper. Um, it's difficult to do that in front of your friends and colleagues, and yet Certainly for me, and I think for so many others, this book was a powerful reminder of why we do what we do. Um, it was a reminder of what we don't do well um, and how we can help. Um, it's a reminder of how isolating this can be, and it's a reminder about um, 
how brave it can be for somebody to sit, examine their feelings, wrestle with them, and then share them in a way to help others. I think Kat is being incredibly modest when she says that, you know, it was work. Um, it is so much more than work. I, in particular, um, am looking forward to reading the sequel in 20 years. Um, <laughs> when Kat reflects back and sees how this changes. Um, I encourage all of you who have not um, picked up a copy to pick up a copy. I strongly encourage you to do not what her sister Stephanie did, but to buy a real copy from a real bookstore. Rather oh, I than have that. <laughs> um, and um, I want to thank all of you in the audience for joining. I am really looking forward to next year when I hope we can all be together in person and that only some of us will be virtual. Um, I want to wish everybody um, happy holidays for April, happy Passover, happy Ramadan, happy Easter, um, and please stay safe, be well, and we will see you again next year. Um, and Kat and Stephanie, thank you again. Thank you so much for having us on. And thank you, Steph, for being vulnerable and sharing so much today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kat, for being amazing. I'm so proud of you. Oh, I'm so proud of you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Morrison.